On today's show, it all started with a pinky swear between a father and a son. Now it's an event that helps kids and their families with the toughest battles ahead. Ever wondered what it takes to have a tackle box for musky plugs? Well, we met a Minnesota inventor who figured it out. It gets the heart rate up, burns the legs a little bit. Next up, it's time for a walk in a park, a visit to one of Minnesota's newest parks, Cuyuna. And our Minnesota Bound Classic this week takes a look at a seasonal favorite. When the sumac turns red, fall is in the air. Those stories and more, next. Minnesota Bound, brought to you by Minnesota Select GMC dealers. Hi everybody, Raven and I welcome you to the show. You ever hear of, you know, this pinky swear thing? Well, there's a foundation named after pinky swear with a story that you just won't want to miss. Here at the Minnesota Horse and Hunt Club, they have come to shoot Whoa. boarding clay because they promised. And look who also promised. Famed Viking coach Bud Grant. Yeah! And Bud's son, another famous coach, Mike Grant. Nice, Mike, nice! And looky here. My daughter Laura and I also made a promise to join the fun to bust a few play birds in competition with the Grant team versus the Shara team. Hey. Hey. Seven and eight. Final score? Doesn't matter. Everybody here is on a winning team. In fact, that's a promise. Pinky swear. Pinky swear? Yeah, when you hook little fingers, pinky fingers, it's a symbolic contract to keep your word. Pinky Swear Foundation really represents a promise between a father and his son. In this case, it was a pinky swear between Mitch, a nine-year-old with terminal bone cancer, and Steve, his dad. Well, the pinky swear happened between Mitch and I when he was, when he was being treated at the University of Minnesota Children's Hospital. Mitch knew that he had been given funds that were in a savings account for him to do whatever he wanted with. He kept on looking at me going, Dad, why do I get so much? And he saw this need in the hospital amongst all these families that it was going to be Christmas and these families didn't have what he thought they deserved. He took money out of his savings account. $6,000. Put it in envelopes. He took him onto the ward and he Flipped slipped envelopes it. with 100 to three, four, five hundred $500 a piece. He just said, Dad, that was the coolest thing ever. Can we do it again next year? Sadly, there would be no next year for Mitch. Before Mitch lost his battle with cancer, he made one more request. Mitch said, well, Dad, promise me you're going to do it. He's like, how am I supposed to do that? Pinky swear promise, Dad. Said, it's like that, right? Pinky swear promise. Thus was born the Pinky Swear Foundation. The Pinky Swear Foundation actually gives monetary support to families that are unable to, you know, pay for those simple bills. No child should be in a hospital fighting such a terrible disease and Pinky Swear does an awesome thing. You know, helps families financially and uh, that's why we're out here today. Now it's grown that we are going nationwide. <laughs> It's, it's evolved into millions, giving millions away. So we wonder, what would Mitch think? He'd say, Dad, thanks for being a keeper of the pinky swear. Coming up, 
plugs and more plugs, a Minnesota has invented the perfect tackle box for musky hunters. Minnesota Bound, brought to you by Minnesota Select GMC dealers. Kingtail Gator. Connecticut. Jesse Treble's Safe Basements of Minnesota. And by Evan Root, the official outboard motor of Minnesota Bound. Up next, if you're a musky fisherman, you know how big these lures are, right? How do you carry them around? Well, a Minnesota man found just the right idea. Travis Frank has the story. Virtually indestructible. It's the trademark of just in case tackle boxes crafted here in this small Minnesota workshop. Bob Schmidt builds his dream here. I'm the inventor, the owner, and the manufacturer. And sales, and purchasing, and admin, and... <laughs> his company and his tackle boxes have become the hot ticket for anglers looking to safely store their big, expensive baits. Key word here, safely. And it's the safety his boxes provide that accidentally put his company on the map. Yeah, it started in uh, 2007. There was a situation that occurred in terms where they got into the family alcohol. A friend's daughter snuck a bottle out of the house. She ended up passing out, you know, almost at a point of alcohol poisoning. <laughs> kind of the time for me to say, well, what about my case of beer in the garage? What about our alcohol in the house? What's out there in terms of for protecting it? And as I did the internet research and everything else, I didn't find anything. So he built this, a clear box with a lock. Liquor safe cases is the term that I use. Started with plexiglass, dropped it on the floor, shattered, cracked, and uh, all of a sudden, okay, it's not going to work. Ended up going with polycarbonate. 30 times stronger than plexiglass, 200 times stronger than glass. Bob found that his cases could protect nearly anything. Brought my musky tackle box in at the end of the season, end of November, early December. Sure enough, the dividers were getting eaten and melting from the uh, soft twister tails and the soft rubbers. And I found baits at the bottom that I didn't know were there. By the time I found them, end of the season, rusted, junk, and that kind of thing. Kind of I put two and two together, that aha moment, and said, you know, why not? Bob accidentally built the perfect tackle box. So this was the aha moment? Yeah, this was the trigger of the aha moment. Uh, this was at the other end of the ping pong table. So what I was working on is this divider set in terms of to be able to hold the bottles yep. uh, horizontally. So this guy's locked up right now. But yeah, in terms of eight individual slots, so I'm going, huh, it could be a tackle box. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. Yeah, yeah, it's like, why not? <laughs> now he builds them in nearly every shape and size. One, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five. So this is kind of like small batch manufacturing process. Probably about two and a half to three hours uh, from start to finish. It's gotta be neighboring on uh, 3,000 boxes. And then everything's grown through word of mouth. And you don't refer things that you don't believe in or aren't game changers, so. In musky fishing, bigger is better, even the box. Bob made me these boxes this year. So this is my first year with this setup. Uh, previously, I've had many of different boxes, but this is the box that I designed. Really wanted a tool compartment over there for all the tools, just easy access when we hook up to some of these fish. It's a box in a box, so actually it does remove. So you can take out different sections for springtime, fall time, that sort of a deal. They're really cool, you can stand on them, pretty much undestructible, and they're also UV resistant, what a lot of people don't know. The technology is in the boxes. And they'll come up and say, you don't know me. 
But I ordered a box on the internet, and I just want to tell you that I, I love my tackle box. It's just kind of mind-blowing at that time, but, it, but it, it's a feel-good. And then when there's days in terms where you're doing a monotonous task a hundred times or something like that, those are the things that kind of rush back to my mind and say, yeah, it's worth it. It's worth it. Maybe someday he'll build safe liquor cases once again, but for now, anglers have his full attention. What are we doing here, Bob? Final test. It works. Next up, this walk in the park has a little bit of everything for everybody, whether it's on the lakes or below. Closed captioning is brought to you by By the Yard, premier manufacturers of maintenance-free outdoor patio furniture and accessories from recycled plastic. Time now to explore another one of our fine Minnesota State Parks in a series we call A Walk in the Park. Up next is Cuyuna State Park. The founder of the Cuyuna Range was Kyler Adams and it was around the turn of the century that he was uh, surveying this area with dip needles and he found there's a lot of iron ore in the ground. Uh, the mining companies moved in and then in conjunction with the shaft mining they did open pit mining. So we had approximately 70 years of an industrial iron ore mining out here. The park was established in 1993. It's 5,000 acres consisting of 12 mine pits and six natural lakes, about 26 miles of natural shoreline. So uh, this is a pretty special area just in not having development along the lakes. A lot of the hills that we have up here are a result of the mining and it turns out it's just an ideal landscape for mountain biking. Instead of one big hill, we have lots of small hills which create really great little places and spaces out there. The greatest trails in the world. The current trail system is about 25 miles. I try to ride all of it. They're as safe as you want them to be for the novice and as fun for the experts as, as necessary. It's fantastic. I mean, if you haven't single track before, you absolutely have to try it. I mean, it's just, it's amazing. It gets the heart rate up, burns the legs a little bit, and uh, when you get to the top, it's absolutely beautiful. But it's also a paradise for water folks too, you know, the folks that want to scuba dive and canoe, kayak, and paddleboard. So it does take us a few minutes to get in the water. So start with that and it okay. should be good. My name is Todd Matthews. I'm the owner of Minnesota School of Diving. Yeah, I've been diving Cuyuna since, well, even before it was a park. I've been diving out there since the mid 80s. You've got fantastic conditions, very clear water. In the summertime, the, the temperatures are very comfortable up into the mid 70s. During the mining times, they were pumping water out constantly. When they stopped mining, the water just naturally you know, floated back in. So again, we have visibility commonly of you know, 20 to 50 feet. We have 1,700 PSI when we want to turn around. We train divers out there, so taking people that are uncertified to do their open water portion of their dive training. I'm, I'm nervous. I'm, I'm very nervous. <laughs> I'm not nervous, <laughs> I'm just struggling. <laughs> but then a lot of the dives that are done are just for pleasure. If you want a nice, easy dive with fish, vegetation, rocks, throw your gear in and walk in. There's 27 bodies of water, but multiple access points into those. We go out, we have a little dive exploring one of the mine sites. In the mine pits you can see uh, fantastic fish life. There's a lot of bass and sunnies and crappies and you do see an occasional walleye, some trout, a lot of northern pike. There's also these old trees that are grown on the sides of the mines, the entire forest of trees you can swim through. There's a lot of mining remnants too. There's old mining shafts, foundations of buildings still down there. It's amazing structure out there.
from a mining wasteland. It's becoming quickly one of the most popular recreation areas in the state. Rendezvous at like 80? Yeah. All right, guys, let's go. We have a little bit of something for everybody out here. We say it all the time, introduce a kid to the great outdoors. Well, I'm finally learning what that truly means. I have two really young kids that I'm trying to get into fishing, and the first thing I noticed when I went to buy them a reel is that pretty cheaply made. So here's a couple things to consider. One, when you pick up a reel, press the button, and make sure that when you close the bale, it actually engages the line. Second thing is the line is a lot of times really old. So when I got home, I replaced it with fresh line. That way, when my kids go to cast, they don't have twirls or knots in the line. I just want them to have a good experience. Having good line and a good working reel gives them a better chance to catch that fish. Still ahead, a look at a fall staple in Minnesota. When the sumac turns red, we know that fall is upon us. Minnesota Bound, brought to you by Porterview Lodge, Ellsworth Creamery, and by Totem Resorts. You know, as the days go shorter in Minnesota, along the road you'll see some bushes with red colored leaves that used to be green. Those are sumac, but that sumac is much more interesting than it looks. In the autumn of our lives, we relish the music of wild geese. We soak in the splendor of tamarack trees we praise the grace of migrating swans. But what about the lowly sumac? There's no poetic tributes, no ode to the most vivid autumn scarlet to feast our eyes. Oh, lovely sumac, it's time we got to know you. Two kinds of sumac, staghorn and smooth, always seem to grow in just the right spaces, turning our roadsides into pretty places. There's a third kind of sumac, one to beware. Deep in wet, woodsy swamps, a poisonous sumac grows. But keep your boots dry, you'll get by. Just remember, friendly sumac has red berries, full of vitamin C. Native Americans and pioneers turned the sumac's crimson fruit into medicinal wine or a tasty drink sweetened with honey from honeybees. Historians say sumac leaves and bark once helped us tan leather, dye our clothes, and cure ailments ranging from diarrhea to gonorrhea. Maybe that's more about sumac than we needed to know. Maybe it's enough to know, amid all the greenery of summer, it's the sumac that heralds a changing season. Its tropical leaves transform like magic into blades of fire. So ends the sumac cycle. Winter nears, its beauty fades, and only sumac seeds remain. Seeds to feed the birds, seeds to start anew, another patch of eye candy for autumn. Oh, Sumac, that's my ode to you. I'm Ron Shera, Minnesota Bound. The beautiful Sumac growing so crimson red at this time of year and so interesting in other ways, right? 
Well, that about does it for us. Remember, introduce a kid to the great outdoors. I'm Ron Shera, and my ANSI star of the show here is Raven. Oh, yeah. Transportation provided by Premier Transportation. Call 1-800-899-7433. For more information on these stories and more, catch us on the web at mnbound.com.